Greetings, Calvary. You're in for a special treat today. It's always interesting and challenging to hear from this weekend's guest speaker. Johnny Moore is here with us, a renowned religious freedom advocate, especially religious freedom in the Middle East. Johnny has been called one of America's most influential evangelical leaders. He's received many awards and honors for his advocacy. Johnny has been appointed twice to the U.S. Commission for International Religious Freedom by the President of the United States, and he's also authored seven books. I just know you're going to love hearing from him today, so please join me in welcoming Johnny Moore. It is uh, such an unbelievable honor to be back uh, at, at Calvary. There are a few churches uh, in America uh, that, that I, I think will actually be in the annals of history as making a historic contribution to the gospel, to, the, to Bible teaching. And this is one of those churches, and Pastor Skip is one of those pastors. And I, I, don't, I don't take it for granted at all the privilege and responsibility it is to stand here in his pulpit today. And I thank you for your, for your warm welcome. I, I have to tell you, though, uh, my message this morning is not a lighthearted message. My last message when I was here a year and a half ago was not a lighthearted message. So if I come back again, I promise to do a lighthearted a light message. Actually, this morning's message is a little more like going back to history class. And so if you loved history class because your teacher was an incredible storyteller, not the type of teacher that just made you memorize a bunch of dates and facts and figures, then you will like this morning's sermon. If you hated history class, you will hate this morning's sermon. So I'm just, I'm just forewarning you. Um, that's not true because it's based upon, based upon God's word. And there are some passages in scripture that are more familiar to us than others. And the passages that I wanna to read to you now as the prologue to what I wanna to say to you uh, this morning are not some of the most familiar passages in scripture. In fact, I bet many, many Christians in their life have never been exposed to these passages of scripture. Maybe you've heard bits and pieces of it. Surely at this church you have because it's one of the great Bible teaching churches. But I want you to listen as I carefully read selected verses of scripture from Hebrews 11, 12, and 13. And then I'll tell you a couple of stories, make a few points, and I'll be done. And here's how it begins. Verse 32, Hebrews 11. I don't have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson, Jephthah, about David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and in mountains. You, you know about the desert in New Mexico. They lived in caves and in holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, he scorned its shame, and then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. 
in Hebrews 13, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that I would decrease and that you would increase and that my words would not be the persuasive words of human wisdom, but a demonstration of your power. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin by telling you the story of an 86-year-old man. He was 86 when they executed him. The, the thought of burning anyone alive is horrific. Of trying to burn alive a man near 90 is unconscionable. This man wasn't just any man either. He was a pillar of his community. He was a revered humanitarian. He was the type of person that when he walked down Main Street of his town, the, the people would file out of their shops just to say a hello to him. They knew his name. He knew their name. You could agree or disagree with his Christianity. Everyone respected this man. He was a revered member of society with a stature that commanded respect. Then one day word reached his community. He lived in the city of Smyrna in what is now modern day Turkey. That the Roman officials were deciding to execute anyone who was unwilling to pay allegiance to the government of Rome. And this man believed that Jesus was Lord, not that Caesar was Lord. So he was on the list. His name was Polycarp. So the Christians who loved their bishop decided to hide him in a farm. And the Roman authorities, the head of the police, decided to take the case in his personal hands. And ironically, the head of the police was named Herod. His pursuers found out which farm he was in, so he went to another farm. And then the Roman authorities found out which farm he was in this time because there were two Christians who betrayed him and informed the authorities of his location. So as they were approaching this farm, the members of the Christian community were trying to persuade Polycarp to go hide again at another farm, but Polycarp refused. Instead, he decided that he would use the time he had left to prepare a meal for the police coming to capture him because that's the type of thing a Christian would do 2,000 years ago. But when they arrived, they were only enraged by his generosity. And so they decided rather than have any mercy on him whatsoever, they dispensed of all the royal protocol. They took him immediately to be executed. And this is where the first miracle happened in this great story in Christian history. The historians tell us as Polycarp was entering into his place of execution, a divine voice came from heaven and said, be strong, Polycarp. And he was strong, this 86-year-old man. The crowds clamored inside the stadium. Polycarp the whole time remained immovable in his faith. They decided to give him one last chance to change his view. All he had to say was three words, Caesar is Lord. But he looked at them and he said some of the most famous words in church history, words so famous that every educated Christian for generations knew them. We've almost forgotten them. They said, all you have to do is say Caesar is Lord. And this man, looked at them and he said, for 86 years, I have been Jesus's servant. He has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? See, Polycarp believed that Jesus was Lord, whether or not the government or the society thought that was an acceptable belief. And in fact, he believed that one day even Caesar himself would have to bow his knee to Jesus. But when Polycarp called Jesus king, this only further enraged the authorities and they demanded that he be burnt alive. And that's when this 86 year old man looked at them in the eyes and he said, instead of focusing on earth's flames, you should be worried about the eternal flame of hell. 
My friends in Texas say that Polycarp is like a Texan. I think he's more like a New Mexican. Not from Santa Fe, though. (laughs) Albuquerque. (laughs) Then another miracle happened. They lit the flame around him. The fire wouldn't touch him. So what happened was the Roman soldiers took a dagger on a stick, like a spear. They reached over the fire and they used the dagger to kill him. And reportedly by the church historian, at that very moment that the dagger went inside Polycarp, a supernatural aroma, as I stand here on the Lavender Festival weekend, which I didn't even know existed. And this fragrant aroma filled the entire arena. And for generations, when pastors would preach 2 Corinthians 2, where it said, the, it says, the aroma of Christ to God, the gospel is the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to one, a fragrance of death to death, another, a fragrance of life to life. The story of Polycarp was a common illustration of this great miraculous moment. Have you ever heard this amazing story? By the way, there's more to the story. When you see a man who has faith this strong, you wonder, where did this faith come from? Polycarp was 86 years old when he demonstrated this faith, but Polycarp had a mentor. He was a church father. His name was Ignatius. And Ignatius was in his 80s when Polycarp was in his 40s, okay? And Ignatius also was martyred for his Christianity. And when Ignatius was on his way to his martyrdom, he wrote a letter to his 40-something protege, Polycarp. And the letter said, stand firm, Polycarp, like an anvil. As a Christian, we ought to bear all things for the sake of Christ, who in every kind of way suffered for us. Oh, Polycarp. A Christian has no power over himself. He must always be ready for service. And I don't know that this is a fact, but I just have to imagine that 40 years later, when Polycarp faced his own moment of fate, he had to have remembered the faith of his mentor, Ignatius, because this is Christianity. We pass down our faith. We remember our heroes from one generation to the next generation. Otherwise, our faith becomes like something thrown about by every wind of doctrine. We just wander around based upon whatever's happening in society, and we try to put Christianity inside of it. But it is so much more transcendent than that. The gospel is the good news for the entire world, and we have a great History and our future generations deserve to know the stories of our heroes. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you another story. This time, um, uh, well, let me, let me start with this. Have you ever heard of someone named Augustine or Augustine? Most of you. A, a, a famous church father. His story, by the way, is amazing. You should read it sometime. He was crazy. I mean, he, he sowed his wild oats. He committed every kind of sin you could possibly imagine. Yet he had a praying mother who basically prayed him into the kingdom. And then Augustine became one of the great Christian authors and apologists in all of history. We still read his works today. And it wasn't because of Augustine. It was because of his faithful praying mother. And, and today, everyone admires Augustine. Every theologian admires Augustine. Every pastor admires Augustine. Augustine is mo- one of the most revered Christian figures in history. Everyone admires Augustine. So I have a question for you. So who did Augustine admire? Here's the answer to the question. It wasn't a man, by the way. It was a woman. Her name was Perpetua. Maybe she reminded him of the faith of his own mother. In fact, Perpetua was the illustration Augustine used in four separate sermons when he was preaching certain texts. He would preach the text and he would describe as an illustration of the text, the life of this woman, Perpetua. He said that her devotion to Christ was universal. He said that men admire her faith more easily than men can imitate it. 
And all the women said, amen. <laughs> Augustine said, Perpetuous faith was so great that the rest of us are little. He said, if we can't admire this woman in deed, we should at least admire her in affection. If not in glory, then in joy. If not in merit, then in our desire to reach her merit. Once he said, talking about Perpetua, he said, we should obey the same Lord, follow the same teacher, accompany the same leader, and be joined to the same head, Jesus Christ, to make our way to the same Jerusalem, pursue the same charity, and embrace the same unity that Perpetua embraced in following Jesus. So who was this woman who inspired Augustine? What was her story? It's an incredible story. She, she grew up in Carthage, the same city where Augustine was from. She died there and was born there. She died in 203. And we know a lot about her because she had a diary. She wrote a personal diary. And for, for all the young people in the room, a diary is a book, that you, a physical book, paper. And you used to take a thing called a pen and you would write your personal thoughts. You wouldn't put them on Instagram, okay, for the, for, for the world to, to see. And Perpetua has, wrote the diary of her life. And it was preserved by a church historian um, named Tertullian. And we have, we have her diary. And she's an amazing person. By the way, most of the early Christians were poor, middle class and lower. Most of them were poor. She was not poor. She came to Christ not from a disenfranchised or less fortunate background. She was the daughter of a nobleman an influential figure in her society. And for someone as powerful as Perpetua and her family, when she came to faith in Jesus Christ, it was a scandal in the whole town. It was like the mayor's daughter. So they arrested her out of her home and they took her right to a dungeon. And I think I have been to this dungeon in Tunisia, which is where Carthage is, modern day Tunisia. And the, the historian that I met with there, I had students there from Liberty University where I served for many years. And underneath this Colosseum, it was the second largest Colosseum in the Roman Empire at the time, there are these rooms and, and they would put the animals, the hungry animals in one dark room and they would put the people in another dark room and the people could hear the an animals and the animals could smell the people. And this is where she was. And she wrote about her imprisonment. She wrote about her torture. She had a newborn son. She wrote about nursing her newborn son when she was in prison. She, she writes about the logistics and emotions of dealing with her, her newborn under duress and the darkness of the, of the dungeon. She writes about another Christian who was imprisoned, who, who went into pr the prison pregnant and had her child in the prison. She, she writes about being aware of her imminent death. She writes about the roughness of the way the soldiers treated her. She writes about other nobles that were begging her to recant her faith in Jesus Christ rather than to die a senseless death as they saw it. She writes about her father who begged her to recant her faith. There's this moment where, where they're standing together and there was a vase in the room, like one of those vases that you see in a museum. And her father's begging her to reject Christ. And she says, Father, do you see the vase sitting over there? Could that vase be called by any other name than what it is? And he said, no. And she said, well, neither can I be called anything other than what I am. I am a Christian. Her father was beaten by a rod in her trial when he tried to interrupt it. The day she died, her father was wailing and this nobleman pulling his beard out of his face and screaming. Right before she died, she had a nightmare. In the dream, it was the emperor's birthday and she was fighting against a rabid animal. And she writes that when she awoke, that in that moment I understood that I was in a fight, not with beasts, 
but against the devil himself. But I knew that mine was the ultimate victory. And then it came her day to die. They took her to the arena. The eyewitnesses tell us that she refused to wear the robe of a pagan priestess for her execution. She would rather be unclothed. She wasn't the first Christian to die that day. So she sang praises and hymns to God as a way of trying to comfort those who were dying before her. And then it was her turn. And the eyewitnesses say that when the animal gored her, she fell to the ground and her hair had been pinned up and it fell down. So what did she do? In that culture, if you were a woman and your hair was down in the third century, it was a sign of mourning. So she managed to put herself together and pin her hair back up because she wasn't mourning. She was preparing for heaven. And then she died, offering her body in view of God's mercy as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God as a true act of worship. Romans 12, 1. Polycarp was 86. Perpetua was 22 years old. Everyone admires Augustine. Now you know who Augustine admires. And our future generations deserve to know these stories. And by the way, they're not just ancient stories. I could take you on a tour all around. The, I could, by the way, I could spend four hours telling you stories. I'm not, not going to do that. There's a clock. And they tell me when that hits zero, the stage falls down. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do that because I, I want to see my family. Um, but there are stories and stories and stories through the centuries, but there are also stories in our modern world all around the world. When, when I wrote this book with uh, Jerry Pattengill, my, my co-author historian, we included a story of Cheryl Beckett. Cheryl Beckett was Dr. Pattengill's Sunday school student. She died in Afghanistan. She worked with this ministry in Afghanistan that had been there for like 40 years. It through regimes, through terrorists, through, through all kinds of wars and famines and winters and summers and all kinds of chaos. The governments came and went. The chaos came and went. This family stayed and they took care of people's eyes. They were optometrists and they just did it as Christians to love their neighbor as themselves. And she decided to join their mission. And in 2010, they were on the outskirts of Kabul and they, they encountered this group of people. They accused them of carrying Bibles with them. They had their personal Bibles with them and they killed them there. And when we talked to Cheryl's father, he said that to this day, he takes comfort in her journals. He says, her journals have been a spiritual oasis for me. Over and over again, I read this theme in her journals. I am not my own. I've been bought by Christ with his blood. I want to know him better. I want to die to myself. Kayla Mueller is from Arizona, next door. And you might, you might know Kayla Mueller because when the, when the United States military decided to, had the opportunity to take out the head of ISIS al-Baghdadi, they named the mission after Kayla Mueller. 
Caleb Mueller was a young Christian woman who loved the Middle East. And so she decided to go help Syrian refugees. It took her to Turkey to help Syrian refugees. And then she heard that there was a a group of, of Syrians that were in need at a hospital across the border in Syria. And so recklessly or fearlessly, she decided to cross that border. She was in her early 20s. And when she crossed the border, she was kidnapped by terrorists. They sold her to ISIS and she ended up the personal slave of the ISIS leader, Baghdadi. And and I can't begin to tell you what that meant. I never met Kayla Mueller, but I encountered her in an unusual way. I was writing a book called Defying ISIS. And I, I was researching in that part of the world when ISIS was at its height. And we encountered a, a, an escaped Yazidi slave. And when she recounted her story to us, she told us that, that when she had escaped, she was imprisoned underneath a hospital. And she was imprisoned with a young American woman. And on the day that she escaped, that young American woman had the opportunity to escape with her, but she chose not to escape. And the reason why she chose not to escape is because she believed that she looked too much like an American. And so if she escaped with the Yazidi woman and, and, her, and another, there were two of them that escaped, she was concerned that she would imperil their lives just because of how she looked. She didn't look like them. She clearly looked like she was from the West. And so she decided that rather than risk their lives, she would stay. Greater love has no man than this, than that they give up their life for a friend. This woman was a hero. Christians should be talking about Kayla Mueller for generations, for centuries, again and again and again. And and she embodied so much of the gospel. At that point in history, when ISIS was at its height, Terrorists killed more Christians in two states in Nigeria over that single year than ISIS killed in their entirety across Iraq and Syria. And yet almost no one knew anything about it. More Christians have been killed in the last century than in the previous 19 centuries combined. I'm always struck by the names of Nigerian Christians. Patience? was 13. Revelation was six. Rejoice was four. They were killed in their village for one reason. They were Christians. So what should we learn from them? So many lessons to learn from them. I'll just leave you with a few. And here's the first one. Persecuted Christians aren't super Christians. They're just regular Christians like the rest of us. There is no biblical standard for the super Christian who pays the ultimate price and the American Christian who lives with religious freedom, even if it is stressed increasingly in this country. When Jesus said in the gospels, whoever finds their life will lose it and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. He wasn't reserving that for the Green Beret Christians. He was just saying it for all of us. When Jesus said, and he, he said it twice, he wanted us to get it in the inspired New Testament. He says in, in, in John chapter 12, verse 25, John also writes it down. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And, and of course, Jesus was not saying in the, in the inerrant and inspired word of God that we are to hate our lives. He was drawing a comparison. He was saying, when you compare what you have in Jesus to the best of what you have in this world, there just isn't vocabulary in the language to describe what you have in Jesus. It is, 
it's like when Jesus said in the amazing parable, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who found a treasure buried in a field. And then he sold every single thing that he had in order to buy that field just to get that treasure. That's crazy. Just sell everything you have to, you know, sell the clothing off your back, your home, your food, sell everything to buy something. What is the point that Jesus is making? The point that he's making is when you finally realize what you have in the gospel of Jesus Christ, when, it, when the lights finally turn on, then, then you would be willing to give everything you have to buy it. You'd give it all away. And yet Jesus says, you don't have to, it's free. For this is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich and we were poor, he became poor so that we might become rich. He says he gives it all to us. That that This is what God has done. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's free. I, I... What I've discovered is that I only see the value of the gospel when I see it through the eyes of those Christians with whom their belief has cost them something, for whom their belief has cost them something. Then the lights turn on. So, and like one time I was on my way to um, India and I, 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 I connected through an airport in Europe. And in an airport in Europe, there was a small museum of, of, of paintings an outpost of a famous museum. And I ran through it quickly. I I did what the average American does. I got McDonald's and then I went to the museum. And I I ran through the museum because Europe's great contribution in the world are those glorious paintings. Ours is saturated fat. So, (laughs) so So I, but it's really, really good. No, of course. I mean, America's the great contributor to everything in history because of our Judeo Christian foundation. But as I went through that museum, Something unusual happened. There are like 15 or 20 paintings in that museum. I walk inside the museum. I'm like done in the museum in under 10 minutes. And yet when I was leaving the museum, I noticed there was this woman who was like looking at the corner of a painting. When I came into the museum, she was looking at the corner of this painting. When I left the museum, she was still looking at the corner of that painting. Why? She knew something about that painting that I didn't know. I don't know if she was looking at the, 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 the brush strokes or the color or the signature or whatever it was, but she knew something about art I didn't know. And so she was infatuated with that corner of that painting. I don't look at her and say, she's crazy. I look at her and say, what does she know that I don't know? And as Christians, When we see the persecuted church, we see things about the gospel. There there are lessons you can only learn as a Christian by either being persecuted or helping those who are. You cannot be a fully discipled Christian unless you are being persecuted or helping those who are. That's why when you flip through your New Testament, you can't go three pages without running into a persecuted Christian or Paul praying for the persecuted Christians or taking a collection for the persecuted Christians or someone dying for their faith or Paul asking us to pray that they are freed from their persecutors. Persecuted Christians are not super Christians. They're regular Christians like the rest of us who have seen in the gospel something that we haven't seen. And here's another lesson. To be a Christian is to be persecuted sometimes. Why do we think that all of society should just accept us? Look what they did to Jesus. The Roman authorities killed Jesus and killed his followers. And for generations, Christians have been killed. Why do we think that believing the same Bible, following the same Jesus, embracing the same faith means that either we should have less of a commitment or that we should have an easier time? To be Christian is to be persecuted sometimes. Jesus warned us in his last prayer as, uh, when he was on his way to being crucified. He said in John chapter 16, he said, the time is coming 
when anyone who kills you will think that they are doing a service to God. And, and you, could, you, could, you could say anyone who marginalizes you or makes fun of you or treats you, you know, in, in, a, in a discriminatory way or, or God forbid, who kills you will think that they're doing a service to God. Are we not seeing that in certain parts of the world and certain parts of our society? And yet he says the reason why they're doing this is because they don't know the Father or me. And so we should preach the gospel to them. When I, when I stood in this pulpit uh, the last time, I, I preached to you a message um, calling for a courage revival in, in the church. And I, I, I read to you some verses that I'll read to you again, and just to remind you of what it means to be a Christian. Galatians chapter one, verse 10 says, am I trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? Because if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul, Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. He said, for we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. As a Christian, we cannot be people pleasers. By the way, as a Christian, we can also not be jerks, okay? We're supposed to love our neighbor. But we also should not have the expectation that everyone is just going to accept us. In fact, it's the opposite many times in, in history. And yet every time there have been great movements of persecution, the church has grown. That's why there are more Christians today in China than there are members of the Communist Party. This is why all of, in Iran, we have the fastest growing movement of Christians in Iran, is happening in Iran, so much so that the minister of intelligence in Iran met with imams in the city of Qom three years ago, and he, he, he was criticizing the imams because of the amount of people who were becoming Christians. And he was saying, it's because you are arguing with each other that they're leaving uh, Islam. All over the world, as you persecute the church, the church just grows. You know, there's this um, uh, habit that some people have of drawing parallels between Christians who face horrific torture and Christians who are discriminated against, and they like to draw parallels. I don't like to draw those parallels. I, I don't like to compare a Coptic Christian beheaded in Libya to Christians marginalized in, in the West, except for one subtle point, that the equation is fundamentally the same. Change your beliefs, or else. But as Christians, we can't change our beliefs. And whether that's loving our enemy as ourselves, or standing up on the truth of God's word, or forgiving those who've done horrible things to us, or saying things in society that may not be acceptable but are true, we can't change what we believe. So how can we help the persecuted? If those are lessons we learned from them, surely we should help them. And I'll, I'll make it very simple. Three things. We should think often about them. Hebrews 13 says we should continue to think about them. We should think deeply about them. We should, are to remember them, Hebrews 13 says. And we're to think empathetically. We're to, as if we were in prison with them. What would it be like to be in their shoes? Don't pray for persecuted Christians unless you ask yourself what it would be like if you were one of them. Don't give to help them unless you ask yourself, how do you hope people would give to you to help you? How do you hope people would be praying for you if you were them? We're to continue to remember them empathetically as if we were there with them. And that word remember in Hebrews 13 is a very, very important word. We're to remember them as if we were together with them, as if we were the ones being mistreated. And the reason why it's important is because if you understand your Bible, the, the Old Testament, the Hebrew part of the Bible, did you know in biblical Hebrew, there isn't a word for history? In modern Hebrew, there is a word for history, but it's an Anglized word. In biblical Hebrew, there is no word for history. There's a word for memory or remembering, but there's no word for history. 
But the word remember or memory occurs in the Old Testament over 150 times. It's why if you, if you practice the Jewish faith, every day after your morning prayers, you have six remembrances every day where you remember when you left Egypt. You remember the revelation of the Ten Commandments at Sinai. You remember Amalek's attack on Israel. You remember the golden calf and the rebellion in the desert. You remember Miriam's negative speech and the punishment she received for it. You remember Shabbat, Deuteronomy 24 and Exodus 20. They're all sort of, sort of in there. Remembering is a key part of the Judeo-Christian foundation of our faith. We're to remember our past. We're to, we're to live it out again in the way we tell those stories. The lessons that are to be learned. We're to remember the persecuted, whether it's Polycarp or Kayla Mueller, whether it's Perpetua or Cheryl Beckett or anyone in between, whether it's those, those, those Christians that died at the hands of a, of, a, of a terrorist at a school in Tennessee earlier this year. All of these things. We're to remember them as if we were there with them. And when you remember something, it draws stuff up in you. Every time I, I preach in, a, in a, a great church, in a large church like this one, I remember my grandfather. He was a country preacher. He never had a church with more than 50 people. He lived in poverty. He lived in a single wide next to the church. He, he didn't have a worship leader, so he taught himself how to play the guitar he wrote songs and then he'd like turn around and preach. And, and it was hard for him because he only had a couple of fingers on one hand because he lived in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And he was working on a saw and he sawed off three of his fingers on one hand when he was a kid. And when I started getting interested in the Bible, I would ask him these obscure questions. And he would quote to me whole Chapters. He didn't have more than a high school education, but he loved God. He loved his word and that was enough. And he didn't need anything else in life. He just needed to faithfully serve God because when he was a kid, he was a rebel and he was on the wrong path and God changed his life and he spent the rest of his life preaching that good news. And my ministry is a continuation of his ministry. And I'll preach this weekend to more people than he probably preached to in a decade or more of his ministry. When you remember someone, you feel differently about them. That we're supposed to feel that close to the persecuted church. And in fact, I'll, I will give my final words this morning to another martyr. Not, not every martyr, by the way, faces the ultimatum question to change your beliefs or die. Some of them just die because they're serving. And that's the case with this martyr. Her, her name was Karen Watson. She was a Southern Baptist missionary in Iraq when she died in 2004. She was a humanitarian worker just helping those in need. And she was gunned down in her car with her three colleagues. But she did something unusual. Karen wrote a letter put it in a sealed envelope and gave it to her pastor to only open in the event of her death. And here's what that letter says in part. Pastor Phil and Pastor Robert, you should only be opening this letter in the event of death. But when God calls, there are no regrets. I tried to share my heart as much as possible, my heart for the nations. I, I wasn't called to a place, I was called to him. To obey was my objective, to suffer was expected. His glory was my reward. His glory is my reward. I thank you for your prayers and support. In regards to my service, just keep it simple. Have Jason or his dad sing a pretty song and then be bold and preach the life-saving, life-changing, forever, eternal gospel and give glory and honor to our Father. Care more than some think is wise. Risk more than some think is safe. Dream more than some think is practical. Expect more than some think is possible. I was call, called not to comfort or to success, but to obedience. And there is no joy outside of knowing and serving Jesus. I love you in my church family. I am in 
his care. Karen. God, I hope no one in this room has to pay this price. But I pray that every one of us in this room would have their faith. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. And just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.